Thank you, family, for joining this morning, and it is good to be in the house of the Lord. It is good to spend time with family, just worshiping his name. We miss not having everybody in this space, but the truth is we have to work with what we have right now. And we're going as the Lord, you know, so we should go. But it doesn't matter where we are. We can worship him. Even if we find ourselves in a deep pit, we can still worship him. If we are together, we worship him. If we are apart, we worship him. There is no distance in the spirit of God. So today I want to want to continue with our series, and it is from stress to rest. And today I'm going to be doing part two of the series. You know, at a time when so many persons are plagued with stressful situations, we definitely want to hear what God has to say and to experience his life-changing touch in our lives. Our bodies are designed to experience a healthy dose of stress. We know that. Stress is our body's natural instinctive survival response to cope with special physical threats or danger. For example, if you're walking past somebody's yard and a dog comes out at you, it is that instinctive thing that causes you to respond in a way to secure yourself. But the truth is, Stress can be dangerous. It can be dangerous if left on its own. It can do major damage. In fact, it can cause mayhem in our lives. Now, God desires for us to walk in rest. He wants to restore to us a sense of well-being, but for us to appropriate it and walk in, walk in his rest, the truth is we have to change our stressful lifestyle and apply God's prescription to our lives. Now, last week, Pastor Dwight started the series and he spoke about how our current society approaches life in a way that fuels stress. As a matter of fact, he said some people consider busyness as one of our biggest virtues. Some of us walk around with pride about our ability to multitask, work long hours, or having a career that is, when you listen to it, really sucking the life out of you. So many persons idealize, idolize the things and approach that causes a life of stress. Pastor Dwight said, quote, stress, anxiety, and worry accomplish and solve nothing, end of quote. He showed us that ongoing unhealthy stress produces negative effects in our lives. And he mentioned some. He said, for example, there's physical symptoms like headaches, muscle tension, and aches and restlessness. Then there are, other, there are physical health problems like heart attack, heart disease, cancer, lung ailments. Then, of course, there are the emotional problems, such as anxiety and anger, or being constantly irritated or irritated. There's sadness, depression, and even a general feeling of being overwhelmed, resulting in some persons suffering with panic attacks. Some persons even going into the place of being suicidal. So stress must be taken in hand. And in Pastor Dwight's sermon, he mentioned a number of solutions. One, that you must remember that God has been faithful. That we need to identify the specific source of our stress. We must be obedient to God's direction 
And finally, we must trust God completely with our future. Now, this week, I continue the discussion. And I want to open, up a little, open it up a little further as I explore the topic, which I believe is directly related to the matter of stress and our attempt to move in seasons, or especially this season, from stress to rest. So if you haven't done so yet, get your sermon notes because we're, gonna, we're going for a little ride. So today I'm going to be talking about restraint. Now what's the def def definition of restraint? Restraint comes from the word restrain. And restrain means to limit, to restrict, or keep under control. Restraint, the noun, means a measure or condition that keeps someone or something under control or within limits. Or unemotional, dispassionate, or moderate behavior, self-control. Often much of the stressful experience we find ourselves in can be directly related to our failure to exercise restraint. For example, you might know that you have a report that is due in a week, but your friends, all of your close friends are on vacation and they have activities planned every day and every night. And you are saying, I'm not missing out on any of this. Now you have two options really, you know. You can say, okay, I'm going to exercise restraint and I'm going to take part in some activities so that I leave enough time to do the report. Or you can go all in, in and just all the activities. You do that, there is no restraint in your action. Come a day before the report is due, no report, you stressed out, then this is one of the things I really don't like. When other people's stress become my stress, because their problem. And that happens so often in organization. You don't restrain yourself or plan your life. And so the day before the report, you are now going to everybody, give me this, give me this, I need that. Restraint. Then another example is, you have some persons who have some issues with some of the things that they watch on the internet. And some of it, you know, there's a trigger you have that causes you to go and watch it. Sometimes you see the trigger coming from a mile off and you have an option. I can exercise restraint by not walking headlong into that trigger and not going to this temptation. Or you can walk headlong into the trigger and end up right back on the internet. Afterward, you're stressed, you're going through shame and guilt, and you go through this cycle again. Restraint is critical to a healthy and godly life. Any life lived without restraint, being properly and appropriately used, is like a car being driven without use of the brakes. Such a life is punctuated with great stress, and lack of control. A life without restraint is a life out of control. Now, I know that some persons, once they hear the word restraint or restrain, they immediately become uptight and uncomfortable because anything that appears to even attempt, to even mention or suggest, a restriction or fetter or control in their life, they automatically resist them and they feel, I don't want to go there. And I can understand some persons being in that state because of all that they have been through. And they associate restraint with those bad experiences that they have had. But whoever you are, I want you to sit down still 
go with me on the journey. Stay with me. Because this is a truth that the Lord wants you to hear. And it is a truth that will liberate many of us to walk in victory. Now the concept, this principle and this practice of restraint, it is not a new thing. In fact, it was established even before the beginning of time. Restraint was so important, it was conditional for purpose and the right relationship with God, even as this was established in the world. It was not just applicable, but was of paramount importance. It was with, sown within God's plan for the earth and for mankind. Now the first point is restraint was a foundational and fundamental principle critical to mankind even before they sinned. And I wanted to get that. You see, mankind was commissioned to bring order to the earth through restraint. Let's go to, to Genesis and listen to the mission that God gave them. We're going to be looking at Genesis 1 verses 26 and 28. Listen what it says. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Now let's jump to verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in numbers. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So when you look at verse 28, you see that from the beginning, we were called to rule over, to fill, and to subdue the earth. I want you to underline the word subdue. Clearly, if they're being required to subdue, then there must be something which is resisting. Mankind was commissioned to bring order by restraining whatever was a challenge to the order of things. God was saying, in addition to being fruitful, mankind you are being required to restrain things in the earth. So the first man and woman were empowered to manage the environment. Now, in addition to the restraint they were to apply to the environment, the second thing is mankind was also required to restrain himself. Let's look at um, Genesis 2, verses 15 to 17. And it says, the Lord took, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And we know the story. We know how Adam and Eve failed. They actually ate the fruit. Contrary to what God said that they should do. And because of their sin, mankind lost the battle. Mankind lost their status, lost their position. Everything went out of whack outside of what God intended. When they were tempted by the serpent, who, mind you, is a creature on the ground, 
They fail because of lack of restraint. Their misplaced desire outweigh their choice to apply restraint. So God's creation, the earth and mankind, went into a state of chaos, a state of disorder. Scripture went on to tell us in different places that it, it got so bad that every man was doing whatever pleases him. Chaos and stress. But thank God the story did not end there. Then came our champion. Then came Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer. The scriptures refer to him as the second Adam. As the second Adam, he came and he restored our former glory, our former position. Through Jesus, we can now reclaim our original authority. And if you remember, even just before he left, and he spoke, it's recorded in Matthew 28 and 18. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And he was saying, no, because you are in me and I am in you, I'm saying now go, because you have the authority. I've delegated it to you. So what am I saying? that we need to know ourselves. We need to know the enemy, and we need to know how things operate. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He comes to bring stress and mayhem. But Jesus, but Jesus, through Jesus, we can, by our reclaim authority, subdue and restrain the earth and the enemy. We can, through Jesus, subdue the things in our environment that is outside of what the Lord requires. Ephesians 6 makes it very clear. It says that we are in a wrestle Mind you, not against flesh and blood. But we are in a wrestle against a formidable enemy. It's real. And we as a people, we need to be aware. And we need to know that we have the right and the authority and the power to subdue and resist it. I was talking to... Um, Someone this week, and I was saying, you know, like when, when lawyers go to, to court and they apply for a restraining order, we need to know that we have this just judge, our heavenly father, and we can go to him and say, I need a restraining order to stop the enemy outside of the road. He cannot come into my yard. We have that authority. And so I deliberately start with the Genesis story so that you can understand how everything began. What was God's intent for us? And then I went down into Jesus to show you now as a child of God who you are. So what can we conclude from this? That through Jesus, I am restored according to God's original plan. Therefore, as a child of the king, I must choose to walk in my authority to subdue, restrain the earth and everything the enemy comes with. That is what you're called to. And I'll mention two scripture, Luke 10, verses 18 to 19. You can look it up. Luke 10, 18 to 19, and Ephesians 2, verse 6. You can do that in your spare time. And the second thing is that as a child of the king, in addition to applying restraint against everything the enemy brings, as a child of the king, I must apply self-restraint. 
Self-restraint, self-control, self-restraint is critical in moving from stress to rest. Then this leads me now into my major discussion. The message just start now. Into my major discussion on restraint. That is restraint of self, self-control. Restraint of self is what is commonly known as self-control. And self-control is exactly what it is. Controlling yourself. Self-control is a critical factor in learning how to deal with stress and anxiety. Have you ever been in a situation where you acted in a way that later made you feel less than proud? And perhaps you were under stress. Or you felt out of your element. Of course, you could make excuses and find something or someone to blame for your poor behavior. But you know that if you had shown some self-control during the situation, chances are you wouldn't have done it and you wouldn't now be tempted to be blaming others or coming up with excuses. You would have behaved the way you wanted. I've had a number of those experiences. Now, the scripture reading that we looked at this morning, we read about a king named Saul. Today, I want to use Saul as a case study. In fact, I think he's a very good case study. A very good case study on the lack of restraint or self-control. And how that issue in his life cost him so much. He lost out big time. It's a sad story, yes, but it's a good story. In fact, it reminds me of Charles Dickens' quote, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. Best of times, because here we find this man Saul, who, though nothing in his own eyes, was selected by the Lord for big things. Saul was God's first selection as the man through whom Jesus would come and through whom his throne and kingdom would know no end. It was one of those stories with a lovely start, intriguing and promising. You know, one of those stories that touches the heart, beautifully orchestrated. When you read it first, you say, yeah, for the underdogs. So Saul was chosen, and he was anointed as king with great plans. And when you read the account, it was not just the great plans, but there was this great pronouncement of the prophet Samuel. It's as if he was saying, in addition to making you king, the Lord is giving you a carte blanche, authority and power. Look at what uh, 1 Samuel 10, verse 6 to 7 says. The spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you and you will prophesy with them. These are some prophets that he was going to meet. And you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Samuel told him that the Spirit of the Lord will come upon him, and the sign will be that he begins to prophesy, and that once that happens, he should do whatever his hands find to do. In other words, Saul set and poised for greatness and for success. And as Samuel spoke it, so it was. Further in verse 8, we see where it says, the Lord changed him into another, a new man. 
And by the time we get to chapter 11, we see proof of this authority and this power given to Saul. By the way, he responded and rose to the occasion when the Ammonites went up to besiege Jabez. It says when, Paul, when Saul heard the bad news, the Spirit of God came upon him and he became incensed. Here we see a previously timid man transformed into a mighty strategic warrior for the occasion. As the Lord promised, so it was. Transformation and great success. And so Saul experienced that. But let's look at Saul two chapters later. Where I want us to look at, and the subhead is, restraint in the face of fear or terror. Now here we have Saul poised for great success. Do whatever you put your hand, put your hand to and you will succeed. Yet by chapters 13 and 15, we see Saul doing exactly the opposite. In chapter 13, we meet a stressed Saul. I would be stressed too. With threat of attack from the Philistines. He wanted to do well and he wanted success. And he recognized that it comes from the Lord. Look at the weirdness of this. So he says, I need to give a sacrifice to the Lord so the Lord will help. He was stressed with much anxiety. Now, if you remember in chapter 10, when we read this morning, Samuel had said, wait on me at Gilgad, and I will come and tell you what to do. So Saul waited, but Samuel did not get there in according with the seven-day timeline. So Saul, not seeing him, at the time that he was supposed to be, to be there, decided to take upon himself the task of offering the sacrifice. This is a sinful and grave act. The Lord's instruction on this is clear. It is not conditional or optional. The offering of sacrifice is a holy practice reserved only for the Lord's anointed priest and prophet. Saul was none of the two. But he still went ahead and, do, and did it. And just as he was finished making the offering, Samuel came. Let's read um, 1 Samuel 13, 11 to 12. And Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Big Mash, then I said, the Philistine will come down on me at Gilgal and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. I wanted to underline felt compelled. Samuel then told him he had done foolishly. Done foolishly for not keeping the Lord's commandment. And that because of this action, the Lord would no longer establish Saul's kingdom over Israel, but instead the Lord will now seek for another man, a man after his own heart. Can you imagine that? Saul's problem was a lack of restraint, a lack of self-control. He's saying, I felt compelled. Feelings should never drive us. There's a saying that your emotion is a great servant, but a terrible master. 
Saul allowed his fear and anxiety to get in the way of good sense and restraint. And the quote I want to share here is this. Never do something permanently foolish because you are temporarily stressed. Never do something permanently foolish because you are temporarily stressed. In moving from stress to rest, I must act with restraint. Fear and anxiety are not my master. My feelings should never trump instructions, God's instructions or his requirements. My feelings are secondary to God's best. The third one is my lack of restraint can affect my purpose and long-term success. Because of Saul's action, that is his failure to exercise restraint, he lost the opportunity to establish his kingdom over Israel. He would have had the lasting dynasty through his generational line. However, that day, he was no longer aligned with God and he proved himself untrustworthy, volatile, unpredictable. Saul needed to have created a shift in his way of thinking and his approach to life. And I want us to take it up to ourselves and think, you can be chosen by God. You can be anointed. You can be appointed. But you need to recognize that your actions can have longer term effects on your purpose than you even think of at the time when you do the action. It can affect your success and can add future stress, disappointment, and depression to your life. I've met a few persons in my lifetime who have done just that. Their lives full of promise, full of purpose, but their choices cause them to abort or shipwreck the plan of God for their lives. Sometimes it is our inability to restrain even the things within us that come natural is our inability to even restrain fear or emotional stuff or issues that we have. Stress is a real thing, but we should not do something foolish because we are stressed. We have to choose what God wants us to choose. What choices we make can affect us. Let us learn from Saul. Now let's go back to Saul. And I want us now to go over to chapter 15. And the subhead here is restraint in gratification of my desires. So in chapter 15, we see Saul going to war. And the Lord gave him strict and clear instructions to attack the Amalekites, kill them, Destroy everything, don't take anything. Look at what verse 3 says. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. And do not spare them, but kill both man, woman, infant, nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Clear. Dust out everything. Wipe it out. Well, Saul went to the war. And he was successful. However, listen to what he did. Look at verse 9. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, 
but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. You see, Saul had a desire for wealth and everything that was good. Nothing wrong with that. However, that desire was so strong, it got in the way of his obedience to the Lord. Clearly, Saul had a greed problem. He lacked the restraint needed to override his desire. And to make matters worse, he refused to take responsibility for what he did, but instead blamed it on the men and made excuses that the men took them to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Now, who is he fooling? Certainly not the Lord. Now, in the same chapter, verse 22, Samuel continued to speak to him. And Samuel made it abundantly clear that what the Lord is after is restraint and obedience. Samuel was saying, don't talk to me about sacrifice. Keep that sacrifice or whatever you are trying to substitute for obedience. The Lord doesn't want that. Because of Saul's violation of the Lord's instruction, Saul lost the kingdom completely. Look at verse 28 to 29. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, and I've given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind. For he is not a human being that he should change his mind. This is just going downhill. But the first action of unlawfully making the sacrifice, God removed the kingdom from going down Saul's lineage. And it was to remain only with Saul during his lifetime. So the truth is, from that, Saul should have learned. But the truth is that so some of us are, especially in different seasons of our lives. Sometimes we are so driven by self-gratification that it blinds us to the bigger picture. It blinds us to obedience. Look at what happened to Saul now. God completely tore everything from him. So, despite God's plan for him for rest, Saul just racked up more and more stress. It's painful. It's a painful account. Painful, but I find it very sobering. And I, can't, and I only pray, Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, to learn. And the truth is right now, even as I speak, persons introspecting, you can't change now. It is the Lord speaking to you to say, for some of us, make a complete turn. Learn from what has gone in the past. Learn from others. The PowerPoint here is, through consistent self-discipline and self-control, you will develop great character. It's not easy, but it, what the word, what, what God is saying, if you are consistently controlling yourself, applying self-discipline, pretty soon the area in which you are having the struggle, you will build good character in that area. And so I ponder, how many persons have shipwrecked their purpose and the big plan God had for them? And did that because of their failure to exercise godly self-control. And you know, it's a serious matter. When we're out of God's will, it adds stress to our lives and we lack rest. When you know that God has called you to more 
and you did not achieve it, it is a stressful place to be. So in moving from stress to rest, I must exercise self-control, self-restraint, as I consider satisfying my desires. Every desire I have must be given the litmus test of God's word. Not because I desire it, desire a thing, does it mean I must have it or do it. I must exercise restraint and self-control. So you ask, so Pastor Joan, how do we do that? I'm glad you asked. We are now going to move into the section, how to gain more self-control. Now Galatians 5, 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Notice that, Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. So it means God is already producing this virtue in you. Every believer has the power to operate in self-control. However, we must cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Like Saul, many of our problems are caused by a lack of this virtue, lack of restraint. And perhaps segments of your life right now, when you look at yourself, are out of control or the operation of restraint. You might feel overwhelmed by your situation and circumstance. And the truth is that can be a scary feeling. Been there. Proverbs 25, 28 says, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Self-control and self-discipline are key factors in success in this life. There are some persons who look very staid and controlled, you know. I was thinking about that. You see them look very staid, but don't be fooled by that. Sometimes it's an ex exterior. Some of them are that way, not because they're exercising self-control. Quite the contrary. Some are that way because they are being controlled by fear and their emotions that keeps them boxed in. So they're still not walking in what the Lord has called them to. Because these external things or the emotion, those things that they are battling with inside, is keeping them in a box. Without the necessary self-discipline or self-control, they are unlikely to achieve anything or la of lasting value. So let me give you an example. I think most people, at least everybody in the staff know this, and the people who are... One of the things that I've had to struggle with is fear. No, I'm delivered from that. But just to show you, so you might see me and I, well, in the past, I'm not so staid now. I was staid and very controlled and very, and you'll say, oh, she have it all together. Not so. Because I had fear, it kept me in line and I kept myself in line. So doing certain things, I wouldn't do it. So you see like this up here now, bringing message, oh, the Lord has brought me a long way. There was a time, oh, Jesus. Now, fear, if I had allowed it, it would have kept me captive. And you would see me going around, oh, she's so, hmm, hmm. Lack of self-control. I had to now take the word of God and say, no, 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 I cannot allow this thing to have me like that. I have to take control of my life, apply godly self-control to become who the Lord has called me to be. And the truth is there's no quick and easy way. You just have to go through the process. 
one day at a time. The first time I came up here, I couldn't come alone. I had to come with my husband. I'm in near buckle. I mean, like Jesus, 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 Jesus. Now I'm fine. Am I not? <laughs> but it is a process. So I had to come to the place where, and the first point now is, how do you do it? I had to admit I have a problem. And that's the first thing. You must admit that you have a problem. James 1, 13 to 14 says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempted me, for God cannot be tempted by evil nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and entice. My evil desire then was not willing to make a mistake. I'm not going up there to expose myself like that. And it caused me to be in disobedience. Thank, thank God I have a husband who whipped me into shape. <laughs> so, you know, he forced me to look at myself. You have a problem. No, I don't have the problem. Yes, you do. So the starting point of developing self-control is to face the fact that a lot of our problem begins with ourselves. The first step, therefore, is to admit that we naturally have a self-control problem. Think about it. Adam and Eve, they did not control themselves. The Lord had said, this is your terms of reference. This is how you're supposed to operate. You need to control yourself and do this. But they didn't. We need to be honest. Lord, I am out of control. My thoughts are out of control. And I see where I am going to go down this road. Grant me self-control. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And I want us to get this. If Adam and Eve, the most perfect I don't know, the most perfect man and woman there was. Garden of Eden, can yeah, I get it no better? If they had the propensity to not exercise restraint, if they are not deliberate about it, it is saying, look we will live into this fallen world if you are not deliberate about making the choices and exercising the restraint within the terms of reference that God gives you, if you don't do it deliberately, you are going to end up in a lot of problems. It is real. Corinthians say, no temptation has seized you. That is not common to man. The same thing that Adam and Eve face, you will face it. Now, the second step is we need to master our emotion. We need to challenge them. We put too much emphasis on our feelings today. First, we think everything has to feel good or it is not worthwhile. Or we believe that everything we feel is legitimate or we need to give it legitimacy. And even in cases where it is legitimate, sometimes we allow it to run us into the ground, take us into unrestrained road. But we need to master our emotion. Now, how do we do this? First, we need to manage, and I must manage my thoughts as my thoughts fuel my emotion. Now, how do I do that? You have to process your thoughts. Ask yourself, is what I'm feeling true? And if it is not true, get rid of it. So, 
I've had occasion in the past when I was struggling with emotional stuff where my husband does something and I said, you see how he reject me? No. I've, I learned that you don't just sit there with that thought. You need to know, ask yourself, is that true? Did he really reject me? And everybody know me have almost, my husband is almost perfect, right? <laughs> and the truth is the other day when Chevron preached, I did say it inside there. Remember Auntie Andrea? Yes, Auntie him. How did you, you know your score really high? Yeah. So I had to ask myself, is it real? No. What is happening then? What was happening then was I was dealing with rejection issues. So I had to say, okay, I'm throwing that through the door. He did not reject me. You need to deal with you and your rejection issues because that is going to get into the way and give the man problem. Because he might be like, what's wrong with you? So that is what you do. When the thing is not true, throw it out. Then you deal with the issue. Get prayer, work at it. Be self-aware and work at it. Get healing. Now, if it is true and real, you say, okay, it is true. I do what this person did, really, was rejection. But you now need to make sure your response line up with the word of God. You have to ensure that you respond properly. So I was remembering, go back now to the same rejection. Years ago, my husband had this girlfriend, right? And things were not so hot. And so he said to her, you know, we need a break. Give me a break. And so tell her I want the break. And he said he was going to disappear for a while. Now, the truth is, she feel rejected, and I can see where that could be seen as rejection. It's real. The thing is, though it is real, she needs to make sure that she respond right. What she did, she went to his apartment and knocked out all of his windows. Now, that is a response. I mean... <laughs> That is not going to get you anywhere. The word of God is saying, you don't respond like that. <laughs> in fact, you do something like that. What it is going to do is just cement in his mind that you see this little break that we said we're going to have? We don't. <laughs> we don't. Because you're mad. <laughs> Which is what happened. But you know, Knock out window, I, I don't know. Ephesians 4, 6 says, in your anger, do not sin. So even when we get angry, we have to restrain ourselves. What would Jesus do? And then when you get that correct, you say, okay, this is what, all right. I'm going to restrain myself. I'm not going to go over the top. Right now, I can't even speak because I know if I speak, I'm going to say the wrong thing. The next thing is, while you are there processing, do not worry or go into anxiety. Now, it is a real thing. Yes, what you're experiencing is real. But if you allow yourself to go into anxiety, that is going to add stress. Instead, you must restrain and force limit your thoughts. Force limit it to say, okay, what are the solutions? And what are the principles of God that I can apply here? And a good one, you know, is when you feel that you're going to worry, go to the Philippians 4 8 principle. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, 
If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So, practically, you would go back to the same rejection thing. You are the fact that he said he's, he needs a break. You take the word and you say, okay, what is true? The truth is that him said want a break. That's true. It is also true that I'm in pain, that I feel rejected. But what is the biblical truth here that I can apply? That the Lord says he will never leave me or forsake me. And because I believe that, I can rest and not go off into the unrestrained road, which is not going to bear any good fruit. Then you can take the rest of it. It says whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely. You can take that and you apply to your situation. Okay, what is there in all of this though that is of good report that I can think of? You force yourself to go there as it relates to the situation. What is of praise? What is, of, what is excellent or praiseworthy? You can even be thinking, you know, the truth is that I even know him saying want a break. He's, he's, he has really been kind and he must be going through his own things. And probably, yeah, I've, I've really not acted right. And then you think, what can I praise the Lord for? Do you understand how you work the word? So you are keeping yourself in a place of restraint. You're not allowing your thoughts to take you down this crazy road. So you master your emotion by controlling your thoughts. Then you are three. You be deliberate about change. If you're going to change and become more self-confident, you have to start believing you can change. And you must engage in the process of change. It's not going to happen if you are just there in Zaza land. You have to be deliberate. When I was processing fear, I had to be deliberate. I had to say, okay, this particular thing normally makes me go into trepidation but I am going to do it. Knee a buckle, but I am going to do it because I'm actively engaging in it so that I walk out of it. It no longer controls me. Your beliefs control your behavior. So you have to challenge it. The right seed must therefore be planted in your mind and you must water it and allow others to water it with truth. So I had to plant the right truth. God did not give me a spirit of fear. He never take me here to leave me. He called me. He's a good father. I planned that. Some days when I might feel, okay, so you have to go preach. Um, remind me why again we need to do this. And then my husband was speaking to, you are called for this. June, you're a woman of God. Da, da, da. And he's speaking to me. Okay, all right. Or I call my girlfriend, Rachel. Rachel, we really don't want to do this, you know. Why do you think we must do it? And she's speaking to my life. I say, okay, now get up and make her do this. Stop giving legitimacy to the bad habits or your unsavory characteristics. And you know, some persons have a way of saying, I saw a mistake. And they say, you, they, that now keep them in that box. That's a mistake. You know me ignorant, and look how you come tempt me. So what? That is not who God says you are. So what if that is what, how you behave now? That does not dictate that this is who you are supposed to be. Stop speaking of it as if these bad things that we do and practice is like a badge of honor. Instead, we need to be constantly looking, how can I be transformed? We need to be transformed. So that's one of the, 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 the things that we need to do under to, to, to get deliberate change. 
Be transformed. Focus on who you are to be and allow the Spirit to work it in you. Remember what Romans 12, 2 says. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So don't say, I saw mistake. What does the word of God say who you are? That is what you are going after. And the PowerPoint is, if you don't control what you think, you can't control what you do. So the more you keep on saying I saw mistake, is the more you will continue being how you stay. Now the next one um, under being deliberate about change is you need to resist the devil. Plan in advance to avoid situations that you know are going to cause temptation in your life. Things that cause you to slip into familiar stress. So if you know you have an eating problem and you love chocolate and it's not good for you, do not bite and put it in the cupboard. If you know you have a spending thing and you can't manage credit card, don't take a credit card. Plan your life to avoid the things that weaken your self-control. Ephesians 4.27 says, Do not give the devil an opportunity. The next thing you need to do when being deliberate about changes, and this is a big one, control your tongue. Proverbs 18.21 states, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. What we say can change our life, our children's life, our community, our family, our nation. We have had so many, as a, you know, in our family, different situations that our, even our children face. And when we meet and pray, and we speak the truth of God into the situation, things change. We have even seen things change suddenly. So we need to partner with God and speak life. Right now, a number of, of us even listening, you're thinking of things in your life and you're saying, you know, I need, I need help with this. Get prayer. Right now, the, the intercessors team, they are in the um, prayer room. After the service finished, go there and get prayer. Partner with God and speak life into your situation. Partner with those who he places in your life to help you to walk the journey. Resist what the enemy wants you to say. Restrain your speech. Anything that is a lie or death is from the enemy. So resist it. Restrain your tongue. If you want prayer for that, go and get it. Many of us have talked ourselves into the pickle we are now in. Do not entertain the enemy and his lies. And the, the next one is, final one, depend on Christ's power. If you want to develop self-control, learn to depend on Christ's power to help you. Galatians 5.16 says, Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. And when you get the guidance, do what the Spirit says. To be led by the Spirit, we need to recognize that, one, not every good thing is always the best thing. You ever consider Jesus' life? Jesus, 
came to the earth. And there were, even in Jerusalem, Galilee, thousands of people who needed healing, needed deliverance. We even see where Jesus step over a number of crippled person, go to one person and him say, you want to be healed? And he healed him. And then he stepped back over the others. It would be a good thing to heal all of them, wouldn't it be? And we would say, heal everybody. Jesus was led by the Spirit. And he did, led by his Father, and he did only what he was told to do. Not every good thing is best. So we have to get to the place where even the Holy Spirit lead you to do certain things and leave some things and you're okay with it. You're okay with it because you're being led by the Spirit. And that is why it leads me now to, to be that to do that, to be able to be led by the Spirit, we need to be growing emotionally to be emotionally well-adjusted. Because if you are not, the Holy Spirit could be telling you, only do the two and left, leave eight. But your emotional state, your man-pleasing issues, your fear of man, your performance issue, your pride, get into the way and you can't, you get so distracted because that is driving you when the Spirit is saying, only the two out of ten. You do the two and you leave the eight. And if you are well adjusted, walking by the Spirit, you're not having no stress. But you're having these emotional things. What it does, it creates this conflict and stress in you when the Lord wants to give you rest. When Jesus was leaving, he said, I have done all that the Father required of me. And when he was leaving, there were thousands of people still to be ill, still to be delivered. But he knew what he was supposed to do. He exercised restraint and allowed the Spirit of God, this Father speaking to him, to do what the Father says. Notice that Galatians 5, 16 says, let the Spirit guide your life. That's the first part. And you will not obey your selfish desires. Notice, it does not say you won't have those desires. But the Spirit-filled person, they're still having those desires, still have to deal with it. But it is just that they won't satisfy them. God starts and we follow. You know, a lot of time what we, what we say is, when we look at our lives, you know, my life is a mess. This is, once I get my act together, I'm going to really live for Him. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit control me then. But that's not the sequence. God doesn't say, get your act together and then I will help you. Spirit of God is speaking, speaking to us, speaking to us. And he says, let me into your life. So we need to be following the Holy Spirit even while we are struggling with the problem and we are growing step by step. And it is as we do that, that we change. You see, the sequence makes sense. We go to God and he changes. Now think of it if I were to tell you that I'm sick, but I won't get better first and then I go to the doctor. You would say you are crazy. But that's what a lot of us do. We say, I will fix this before I try following the Lord all the way. And if you need prayer on this, you know, you can get prayer. We have the intercessors right there in the room, in the, in the prayer room, ready to.
to pray with all of all of you. Philippians 2.13 says, It is God who works in you, both to will and to do His good pleasure. It is all about Christ. Self-control is about Christ's control. The secret of moving from stress to rest is Christ's control. We need Him. And if you don't have Him yet, I want to just invite you now. Because that is where it begins. So if you don't have Jesus, I want you right now, wherever you are, and you want to receive him, I want you to just say this prayer with me. Dear Father, I thank you for your love. I realize that I am a sinner in need of you. I realize that the only way to you, Father, is through Jesus Christ, who came on earth, suffered, gave his life for me. But I also realize, oh God, and believe that he is raised from the dead. And today, I recognize that I'm a sinner, and the only way to you is for my sins to be forgiven. So today I repent of my sins, everyone. And I ask Jesus into my life now. I receive him as Lord and Savior. He is the only way to you, the Father. I thank you and I receive this gift of salvation. Amen. And for the rest of us who are believers, my, my prayer is that even as I spoke, that you will even be thinking about the things that you need for the Lord to deal with. If you recognize that you're not, you have not been applying self-control to your life, there is help. The Lord wants to help you with that. He wants to take care of it. If you recognize that, you have been allowing stress to dictate what happens in your life. That you've been making bad decisions because of stress. You can't get prayer. Remember our intercessors are there in the room ready to pray with you. If you recognize that the enemy has been doing a major one in your life. Discombobulating your environment. And you have not been taking control to subdue him. You can get prayer. You can have persons who join along with you today about that. The Lord wants to meet you. And whichever other point in the sermon or thoughts that the Lord has brought to you and you need prayer, don't let today pass. Go to the prayer room. Someone is there to pray with you. Today the Lord is here to deliver and to break some of these cycles in our lives. He wants, us to, wants to give us rest. Take us out of stress to rest. And his heart is towards all of us. He knows the journey. He knows the issues. He knows them. So let's just prepare our hearts, even as the worship team is going to come and minister to us.